Um, I'm delighted now to be joined by Deborah Pierce. Deborah is the Joint Managing Director at SLC Marketing, PR and Representation. And this is an area that I think a lot of people may have heard of, but maybe an awful lot about. So I'm really delighted that Debbie will be here today to lift the lid on what it's like to work in this part of the sector, um, helping people engage and communicate and how they people can build their businesses. So Debbie, are you there? Yes, can you hear me and see me? Yes, can indeed. Excellent. Welcome to welcome to IT Future You. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for um, having me. This is the, the first um, event of this kind, Future You, that I have joined. Um, SLC was a relatively new member of ITT. We'd only actually joined up, I think, in January of of this year and um, I was fortunate enough to attend I think the one and only networking event this year and, and meet your colleague um, Danny at that and had a chat and said oh I'd love to get involved and, and here I am talking to you so power of the network I'm going to come on to that a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail so Claire do you just want me to start absolutely go ahead I think Ben Great. you should do you have control of the screen so I think you should be able to share your screen uh, I haven't actually got a PowerPoint or a presentation to share oh, with you. Oh, that's great. So. Okay. Well, let's my just straight my to the screen. Yes. Great. No, your face is perfect. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, Claire and Deb. Deb, um, Ben's still sharing his screen. So I'm just um, going to give him a call. Don't worry. Super. Deb, thanks, Claire. Start, and I'll call Ben. OK, no worries. So, yeah, apologies to everyone who's just got to look at my face. I was rather horrified when I came and I saw Ben had a whole presentation. But by then it was obviously too late for me to be able to um, get anything up and running. So I'm afraid I'm just I am just going to talk with you today. Um, so um, what I wanted to share with you today is a little bit about how I've ended up in the position that I'm in at the moment, how I got here, my route, um, and then tell you a little bit more about the sort of candidates that we look for um, to come and work for us and what we're looking for people to demonstrate in their cover letter and in their CV. Um, so I, like you, uh, studied tourism uh, back in 1985 was I went to Somerset College of Arts and Technology which is in Taunton down in the West Country and I did no ND in tourism and then I went on to what was Bristol Polytechnic in 1987 clearly revealing my age here and I did an HND in tourism because back in my day I think there was only one degree course at that point um, at um, I think it was at Durham University and everyone else um, taught HNDs and ONDs if you wanted to enter the travel and tourism realm. So I completed my studies in 1990. It was a sandwich course. I had done uh, two placements, one as a resort representative and one as an air hostess, which was just fantastic experiences and, and really great things to have done. But when I left in 1990, I joined a travel agency called Travel, and I was a frontline seller. And looking back, I think I probably learned a huge amount in that role and it was the best thing that I could have if you can nail sales skills, um, then they're with you for life and you can take those across any other um, genre that you may go into in the travel industry. So I was with this company called Travel um, for about seven years. I started as a sales consultant. I worked my way up to general manager. I finished looking after the telesales department in London and also we had shops in Leeds, funnily enough, and um, in Manchester that I was also responsible for. So I was responsible for not just the, the staffing and the training of the staff, but also obviously driving the sales and um, achieving the sales targets through those three different departments. Um, I then um, ran my own business for a number of years um, and also worked quite a lot in business development for different verticals before I came back into the travel industry um, at the end of 2009 when I joined the Monarch Travel Group um, in a marketing role. So I joined initially as a search marketing manager and I was in charge of uh, pay-per-click advertising, search engine optimization, and I worked my way up to head of marketing. And I think that that shows you how you can segue skills. I started as a salesperson, got my grounding in the travel industry, understanding the travel industry, but through doing various other roles and running my own business, I was able to move more into a marketing sphere 
I left there in the middle of, I think, 2014, and I joined a technology company. Um, and they were a technology company that produced tech platforms for travel businesses, their back end booking systems. So it tied in. Um, with what I've really been doing at, at Cosmos and Monarch and pulling in feeds from um, different advertising platforms. So I joined them, worked for them for nearly three years before being asked to join SLC uh, Travel Marketing PR and Representation, which is the company that I'm currently working for as joint MD. And I think something to really emphasize that is that I was asked to join, I was, I was approached. Um, and I was actually approached by my first ever boss at Oz Travel. So Sandra Leach, who had been my boss at Oz Travel, um, she was sales director there, had set up SLC representation in 2002. I'd stayed in touch with her from that first initial role, which ended in 1996, um, on a professional basis. I'd stayed in touch with her um, throughout the years, we'd meet maybe once a year for just a drink and a, and a social catch up. Um, and she actually approached me in uh, 2015 and asked me if I would be interested in joining her company. And it's that network that I really want to stress upon you how important it is and just um, how that sort of demonstrates um, how it is often who you know, along with what you know, that will actually secure your role. And if there's one piece of uh, golden advice that I give you today, it would be to grow your network um, and stay in touch with people, and especially the peers that you're sitting surrounded, well, not sitting surrounded by, because I realise you're all virtual, but your peers on the course, for example, that you're doing at the moment, they're going to be um, leaders in your industry in the future. So they are the foundation for your network. So my day job um, at SLC representation is um, incredibly varied. Um, pre the pandemic, we were a team of 27. Um, we have two offices, one here in London and one in Sydney in Australia. Um, and we had 30 plus clients. Now, we have had to contract, as most travel businesses have had to during this time. But uh, we've shrunk to now 10 team members in the UK and one team member over in Sydney in Australia um, and our client size has contracted as well but we believe that we have um, contracted to a point where the business can continue and we're very much looking forward to 2021 and looking forward to growing the business again. Now I was very hands-on before um, but I'm even more hands-on now um, so I uh, have direct contact with clients um, who I'm, I'm servicing and looking after I'll come on to that a little bit um, what that actually means what, what it is that we actually do so I have daily uh, client contact and client responsibility um, I also look after all of our HR functions I'm in charge of all of our operational processes so that's everything from um, looking after insurance insurance claims we're going through a business interruption claim at the moment with our insurance providers so collating all the information that they need um, right the way through to sort of managing and looking after all the tech issues and I've had quite a major tech issue this morning where uh, a domain wasn't renewed and our website actually went down it's, it's now back up and running unfortunately but I, I hope that demonstrates to you just how hands-on I am and just how hands-on everybody is in in our business and again along with my networking tip my other tip um, would be uh, when you go into your role is um, if, if, a, if a job needs doing pick it up and do it because you will be you may not be recognized for it immediately but but it will be noticed and it will be flagged and you will be commended even if someone doesn't verbally tell you commend you for actually doing it plus you'll learn something um, so never think that just never think it's not my job if you spot something that isn't being being done offer to do it volunteer to say I noticed this hadn't happened I can do that it will be very much appreciated so a lot, large part of my uh, day job that I just alluded to was client contact. So our company is a representation, marketing and PR company. And I very, very often I find that people aren't aware of exactly what we do. So essentially, essentially we're an intermediary, we're a middleman. And we sit in between maybe a hotel in the Himalayas, for example, and the distribution um, intermediaries. So we are the people that have got all the contacts. Uh, we know people within the distributors, within the travel agents, within the tour operators. And we will be talking to them about that hotel in the Himalayas. We'll be relaying their um, unique attributes, their key selling points, the reason they should be included in, in a tour operator or travel agents program and their offering to their 
um, to their consumers. We will be providing that information and we will be doing our very utmost to get the travel agent or the tour operator to uh, contract the hotel and put it on sale for their consumers. Because if you think about it, um, there's many very well known um, hotel brands, um, the one that Ben was was just uh, talking about, um, and many more across the globe. But these smaller independent, more boutique hotels um, and attractions and destination management companies, they find it very hard to break into the um, UK arena because they don't know who to talk to. They may not understand how um, commercial contracts are negotiated here in the UK. Often there may be language barriers, um, cultural barriers, different ways of doing business. So they come to a company like ours, and that's called travel trade representation. And that's the bread and butter of what we do. And essentially, it's it's a hybrid of sales and marketing. Essentially, we are salespeople because we're selling, um, but we're also providing marketing functions. And then the other um, services that we offer are public relations, so PR, um, and we work across a number of destinations looking after their PR. So we've got a team of people who've got great contacts in the media world and who are PR professionals. And then we do a lot of um, actual marketing. So we would work for a destination or an attraction or a hotel, either on a retained basis, and they'll give us an annual budget that we'll spend across a variety of mediums in order to um, deliver their, um, their requirements and return on their investment. So um, we may be given an annual budget and we'll look at that annual budget and say, well, we're going to spend X amount with these airlines and Y amount with that travel agent and C amount with with that tour operator, for example. And then we'll look at the various channels that we're going to use and routes to market. Um, and I mentioned working with travel agents, airlines and tour operators because very often we're um, doing the marketing on behalf of, say, a destination and um, the destination, obviously the consumer who's going to see the de destination advert needs somewhere to book that destination. They need somewhere that they can actually go and, and have a call to action. So we'll work in what's called cooperative marketing agreements with airlines and other travel intermediaries, tour operators, travel agents and the like in order to be able to fulfil that marketing and actually drive the consumer to that destination by giving them somewhere to book. So that's an outline um, of what we do. Um, as far as what we're looking for um, when when we're looking for uh, team players, we've um, got this mantra um, that we look for people that are hungry, humble and smart. And those are the three attributes that we're looking for people to um, deliver. Now that when I say humble, um, it doesn't mean that I don't want somebody to come and tell me that they got a first in their degree. That's absolutely fabulous. And I absolutely um, want them to be proud of that. But what I don't want to, to do is to have people in my team that are particularly boastful and that are um, constantly looking at what they have done and what they have achieved. It's a fine line between being boastful and humble. But we're looking for people that are quietly confident in their ability and are very humble about it. They need to be smart, um, so they need to be clever and, and intelligent and switched on. We expect them to come to an interview with an understanding of the travel industry. We will ask them what's happening in travel news, and goodness, there's enough of that around at the moment. But we will ask some quite pertinent questions. So I'd always suggest to anybody before they go to an interview and travel to have read the Travel Weekly or the TTG online editions and um, be up to date with what's actually happening in the travel industry. Um, but we also want them to be hungry. We want them to have this innate um, desire within them um, to want to um, succeed. We want them to um, be quite aggressive in their um, pursuing of goals. And we want them to um, demonstrate to us that they're willing to push and do whatever it takes to get a job done. When it comes to your CV, I'm sure you've had many sessions um, at your college or university, but I think one thing to just um, reiterate from my point of view is that I think the average that anybody looks at a CV is at something like seven seconds, so it's not very long. So you need to make it visual if you can, use colour, keep it to one page and have it um, a very clear layout so that somebody can um, understand the gist of what you offer very, uh, very quickly. 
And I always do think that um, any work experience, whether that's a, a one week work placement or whether it's the fact that you, you've done a paper round or worked in a news agent, it's all relevant. And what I would ask you to do is if you've had limited, maybe you're looking for your first job in the travel industry, so therefore you've got limited experience, think of the experience that you have got, you will be able to tail, tailor that to the job you're going to. So if you're looking at a, a retail job, and you're looking at, at a job working for a travel agent well you've got customer service skills so you need to tease out those pertinent points and be able to um, refine them and um, pivot them to the job that you're applying for um, i think um, volunteering is is quite interesting to see um, personally i'm not as interested in people's hobbies um, but i am really interested if you have done some volunteering and some giving giving back because for our business that re really plays into this sort of ideal team player that we're looking um, to to attract and i think um, another point that i would um, suggest is um, especially because we are looking at this period of 2020 where the travel industry has contracted. I think we're all feeling very confident about 2021 and, and I think we're all feeling a lot more confident that there'll be more positions available, especially for people that are first entering the industry. But I would suggest to you, don't wait for those jobs to be advertised. Give give some thought to what you want to do when you finish your college course or your degree course, the sector that you want to go into. Start researching the businesses that might be attractive to you. Follow them on LinkedIn. Um, reach out, as Ben said, um, to the key people that work within those businesses with a note saying, I'm really interested. I'm studying tourism at the moment. I graduate in 2021. Um, I particularly liked X, Y and Z that I saw you do. So start making some inroads now. And then when you're ready, um, hustle for a job. Send the managing director or the director or the hiring manager an email with your CV and a covering email or covering letter and just say, you know, I. I like the look of your business, I can do X, Y and Z. Um, if you've identified a problem or an issue that they've got, you know, if you, I don't know if their social media is not fantastic, then just you could always say in that email, um, I noticed that you only send one tweet a week. Um, I'm really good at social media and I would be able to help you with this and I could come in and maybe maybe um, talk you through what I can do because it's about getting your face in front of them, it's about getting that foot in through the door. And then another idea that I'd also suggest that people have done with us and, and we've always welcomed it is say, could I come in and shadow someone? I'm really interested in marketing, I really like your your organisation, would it be possible to come in and do a shadow day and just spend a day looking in that department? Because again, it's all it's these small steps to making your sale it's, it's, and selling yourself to them. And it's far easier if you've actually met them. Um, I'm really happy for anybody to link in with me. So have a look at slcrepresentation.com. Have a look at what we do. See if that's something you're interested in. And if you are, please do link in with me. Um, if I come back to where I started, um, network, my current job because of my network, um, I really can't stress enough how important that is. And you're talking to me today. And if you link in with me, of course, I'm going to accept you. You don't know who I know that you might be talking to come next September, um, who might come to me for a recommendation and say that they saw um, your name, for example. So I think it's a really um, valid thing to do, and I'd really suggest um, doing that. Um, so I think persistence and resilience are skills that are always really important. If you are persistent and if you have got resilience, you don't fall at the first hurdle, um, then it will pay off and it will pay um, dividends in the end. So um, I think Claire, that probably brings me to the end of my long ramble. Did you have any questions for me? Because unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to join the Q&A um, at 12.45, I'm afraid. Well, um, yes, Deborah, absolutely. So thank you first for that. That was really, I found that really interesting. I mean, I have a, a lot of friends who work in, in that space and, and it's one of those jobs I've always thought, oh, I wish I, I'd followed that route. Um, but I'm very happy with the job I do, so don't get me wrong with that. But uh, I think it's absolutely fascinating to be able to help market and, and grow people's business in destinations and in, in you know, um, in different countries. Um, I'm quite interested to ask, to find out maybe, given the changing 
world that we're in and going forward and if people are suddenly thinking oh do you know I never really thought about marketing and representation as an industry and and you gave obviously um, a great example of how you got into it but there are there any specific skills that they that the people on here could be thinking about honing now that would give them that extra step up um, when it comes to pursuing a career yeah, so for a career within um, travel trade representation, which as I said, it is our bread and butter, we're looking for people that um, I think are salespeople ultimately. So we're looking for people that are, are confident, that are able to um, look at a, um, say, a hotel and be able to draw out its um, unique selling points and to be able to relay those to somebody else. So I think sales skills are really, really important. And when people come to us for interviews, we'll quite often give them one of our clients and ask them to go away um, and consider it and come back and present it to they were going into a commercial meeting with a travel agent or a tour operator, and they were pitching why this hotel should be included in someone's program. So we might say you're going into see Kuoni, for example. And what we'd expect the person to do is to go away, look at the particular client hotel's website. Um, as I said, really understand the, the unique selling points for that property. We'll go to it, what the benefits are, and then also look at Kuoni's website and see which hotels they're selling that are, are similar or in that same destination in that area and be able to present a presentation to us that does tell us how fantastic the particular hotel is, but tells us as Kuoni why it should be in their portfolio and what the benefits would be for them in their portfolio. So they might say things that's something like, I don't know, you've got five hotels in Krabi, but you don't have one on this particular Raleigh beach, for example, which is where um, Leonardo DiCaprio filmed the beach. And it's the one part of Krabi that everybody um, wants to go and see. And we've got this fabulous property, which is there. And the rates are going to be X compared to the cost of the, of the or the price that you're selling your current Krabi hotels for. So it's really looking for those subtle differences. So sales skills are really important. Presentation skills are going to be important. Just confidence really is important. And I know that that's easier to say when you're, you've you worked in the industry for many years. But, you know, we all started somewhere. We all remember what it was like to be um, back there at the beginning. And everybody, nobody knows everything. And I just think having the confidence to stand up and say and ask questions as you go along it's really important if you don't understand something just ask if you're in an interview and somebody uses an acronym because in travel we love an acronym don't we we love Certainly. you know any acronym if you don't understand it just ask I'd much rather somebody asked and understood it than sat there thinking I haven't got a clue what she's talking about and and then walked out that's brilliant and 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 I think you're right I think it's it's challenging is it uh, obviously at the moment to hone those presentation skills because a lot of the students here today aren't necessarily in a classroom setting so again presenting um, is is going to be a challenge but actually presenting online will continue to be a large part of what we need to do going forward so learning how to be effective in your presentations online and getting that messaging across in in a virtual um, setting as much as in a personal setting is something that can be practiced by students at university um, when they're doing their project work and working in their groups and things like that so you know take every opportunity to do that sort of communication even at the moment whilst we are um, you know whilst we're living in this virtual world um, and and you're quite right it, confidence is a large part of it and if you don't like standing up in front of people and talking then you know this part of the industry won't be for you um, but there are plenty of other jobs that will be so I, yeah and I think as well though I think um practicing online is actually quite it's much less daunting it's much less daunting for me to stand here and talk to 70 odd of you because I can only see Claire's face and having done lots of presentations I, I find there's a lot less daunting than if I was actually coming up to Leeds and standing um, in front of you. So I think it's a great practice um, environment to really sort of get used to standing up and talking and hearing your own voice. And it, it's really good to practice in this environment and hopefully it'll make people feel more confident. Absolutely. And, you know, we all suffer, don't we, from those those pre nerves when we get up on stage, whether it's for 50 people or 500 people. I mean, I I actually went to Brazil um, about 18 months ago to do a talk at a conference and I got up on stage in front of 1500 people. And that was and, and 
and I'd done the tour, you know, I knew what I was talking about. I was confident in what I was doing, but there was something about a huge room of people and also having to be translated as I spoke that was was completely daunting. But it was it was something that I got very nervous about, but I did it and I overcame that nerve. Um, and, you know, and, and you're right, anything that you can do to to practice and, and do that is is going to help you going forward and, and will look good on your CV. And, and I also really liked um, your point about things like shadowing that is something that is great to see on a cv and i see lots of cvs um, and i think what's also interesting at the moment where younger people maybe um, who have graduated or are due to do work experience this year um, may not obviously have been able to do that um, because of because of the lockdown um, but and there are a number of volunteering opportunities out there and again it's kind of what people are doing to keep themselves occupied and to learn skills because whatever you do you will be learning skills it doesn't necessarily have to be in this sector at the moment as, as steve said in the, in our opening um talk you know the next six months there's just not going to be anything out there really for people um but people will still be going out there getting jobs and they will be honing different skills that will benefit them in their careers when they do come back to the sector or join the sector um, for the first time. So still lots of opportunity there. Yeah. Well, Deborah, thank you so much. Um, I'm conscious we are we are running behind times, um, but really appreciate um, your time and um, oh, and as always, and you know, delighted that you obviously have joined the ITT and we've got we brought you into future you as, as quickly as possible, yeah. which is great. No, really. thank you. Thank you very much. And again, that's networking. That was me going to a networking event and, and meeting Danny. So, you know, don't, don't think it's ever over for any of us. We're all still out there doing our hustles. So, um, quite right. Quite right. Thank, thank you, you, thank you so me. much. And uh, very soon. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Bye. So, moving swiftly on. Um, Delighted to welcome our next speaker, Chris. Chris is the Sales and Operations Development Director for Ibiza Rocks, which is a very exciting youth brand that many of you will be aware of. I like to think I'm still young enough to do it, but uh, maybe not, though in my head I absolutely am. So um, Chris is going to have a chat with us, talk to us about what it's like to really look at these sort of exceptional customer experiences that companies like I Beat the Rocks um, can deliver so uniquely to their customer base. Um, so Chris, over to you. Chris, it's the famous it's the famous phrase of 2020. You're still muted. Right there we go. Have you got me now? I have indeed. Perfect, perfect. Well, good good morning. And um, I think like like you just said, as my age as well, kind of um, maybe I'm not so much a, a customer of, of our brand, but 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 more an ambassador and uh, and an employee within it. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted to to be having the opportunity to talk to you this morning um, and talking to the future of our our wonderful travel industry. Um, and I hope over the many coming years you get as much out of it um, as I have over the many years that I've I've worked in it. And it's been brilliant just even listening to. The other presenters um, talk about their experiences, many that I can relate to and and, and understand and appreciate as well. So, um, and you might detect a, a southern accent in my voice. I am from the south, but I now live up here just outside of Leeds. So it is a shame that this is a virtual um, conference because it would have been wonderful to, to have been there um, today. Um, but I, if you get nothing from my presentation today, other than the fact that I met my wife in the in the travel industry, um, we met at Thomas Cook and, and got married. About 11 years ago and have been uh, wonderfully happy um, in our lives ever since and uh, that was something that she said I had to I had to say this morning um, let me share my screen and hopefully hopefully this works all being well um, so if I do that and do that and I'm hoping that you can now see my screen we can, Chris, cool. thank you. You've got it. Wonderful, perfect. Okay, um, so as Claire said, I'm the Sales and Operational Development Director for Ibiza Rocks, and that is our famous cinema sign. Um, but what I want to do this morning is, is take you through a short summary of my journey in, in travel that started way back in, in 1989 um, and led me to today, where I am the, one of the directors of, of Ibiza Rocks Group. Um, I started my, my life in travel, my, although my working career started 
when I was 15 at, at Intersun. Um, and it was interesting listening to Steve because I do remember Steve from those days at Intersun and the ILG group. I, I, I always knew that I wanted to work um, in the industry. Um, I was the annoying kid that would sit with the holiday rep when we went on family holidays to Spain um, and would spend most of my time helping out the rep in the hotel rather than being with my family by the pool because I knew it was something that I wanted to do. Um, I wanted to get into the travel industry. I wanted to travel. Um, and I think Ben spoke about the wonderful opportunities you can get by traveling here, there and everywhere. And I knew that that is kind of what I wanted to do. So um, getting to know the role of the holiday rep at a very young age was something that I was keen to do. Um, and then I was fortunate enough um, to have a friend, a family friend that was working at Intersun at the time. And I was it was an opportunity that I had to arrange my own work experience and I had two weeks working in the reservations team at Intersun when I was 15. That then led to a Saturday job. I was banging the manager's door down uh, just before my work experience was coming to, to an end because I knew that I, I wanted to work in this industry so much and um, I got the opportunity to take a Saturday job so balancing my studies with working in uh, in the reservations department every Saturday and every Sunday um, during my last year at school um, and then straight out of the back of my exams went into the in full time at, at Intersun um, and it was a wonderful company to, to, to work for um, and it was based in Bromley and as Steve mentioned when Intersun um, then uh, in 91 um, stopped operating. Um, Cosmos Holidays was also based in Bromley, which was incredibly fortunate. Um, and I got an opportunity to join the 24 hour emergency duty office, which was kind of working two days, two nights, dealing with many incidents um, and things that really um, make you grow up very, very quickly by dealing with things such as riots here and big long flight delays and, and, and deaths in resort, et cetera, and really supporting teams in resort. And by being on the 24 hour emergency line, but also by dealing with those people, again, it just reinforced my desire to, to, to want to go and work overseas. So um, with Cosmos, I spent a wonderful seven years. And I think there's a bit of theme with the presenters you've had so far, because we've all spoken about working overseas. Um, and I'm very much an advocate of working overseas gives you a fantastic foundation. Um, to your future career um, within the industry. Um, I've worked in a number of great places. Bodrum, Ibiza was my last place that I worked in, in, the, late, in the late 90s. Lapland, you can see there, Portugal, etc. So a number of different, different resorts that I had the, the, the pleasure of working in and, and learning different cultures and, and environments um, to, to spend summers and, and winters with them. Um, and just like uh, Ben, um, I got to wear some wonderful uniform. Um, I made some brilliant friends, lifelong friends who, and back then there was no Facebook, there was no mobile phones, bizarrely, it was that long ago, but I still managed to, to keep in touch with many of the people that, that I worked with. So you are put in situations um, where you are living and working with people pretty much 24 seven and socializing and, and they do become life, lifelong friends, um, even though the, the uniform that you were forced to wear um, my, my, uh, wasn't exactly fantastic, um, but the experience was, none, was nonetheless. But working overseas taught and, and gave me an awful lot. And, and, and like, like, like the previous presenters have spoken about, the, the core fu fundamental skills that you get when you work overseas and in holiday resorts, whether that's working skills and personal attributes as well. So some of the things that I've just highlighted here um, are the fact that I in my working skills, I got sales, I got customer service, I was having to sell events, I was having to sell excursions, um, dealing with customers 24 seven. Um, as Claire mentioned that presenting, having to stand up in front of groups of people, customers on holiday, a lot of them didn't wanna be at a nine o'clock welcome meeting when they landed at four o'clock in the morning um, and you had to try to make yourself um, understood and heard in an, in an engaging way. So presenting skills was a big thing that you, that you learn working overseas. Managing incidents, um, things happen, unfortunately, in holiday resorts. And so management of incidents is something that you very quickly get to, to learn and how to deal with things when they when they don't go quite as they should. Um, and cultural awareness as well, working in Turkey, working in a Muslim country and, and all, all that that brought and the wonderful things that I learned in, in those environments as well. So the many countries you work in, the, the many things that you learn about about culture as well. 
but also personal attributes. I learned independence. I hadn't cooked. I hadn't ironed before I'd gone and worked overseas, sadly. Um, I was a, a, a typical young guy. Um, and, and so independent skills, I had to learn incredibly quickly. I learned some lang I learned a language. Um, I built up my confidence. I wasn't not confident before I went overseas, but it just in, it just helped me with my confidence, coping with pressure and dealing with situations and, and just dealing with people, people being people. Um, and there's nothing like the British traveller sometimes that can be quite challenging. And, and as I'm sure any of you will, will probably be able to relate to that. Um, but always work hard, play hard. Um, yes, you, the, the job working overseas is incredibly difficult and challenging, and that's the, the charm of it in some way because it challenges you, but you've got to find that balance between having a good time as well. So um, I have many experiences of literally going from the bar, getting a shower, putting my uniform on, and going straight out to, to do a welcome meeting um, with a little bit of a headache. But just one summer overseas can, can truly change you as a person and the person that gets on the plane in April and the person that gets on the plane in October to come home is very much a different person and a different person for, for the better, as, as our, our previous presenters have said as well. Um, and working overseas led me to my, to my time at Thomas Cook. I left Cosmos um, and joined Thomas Cook. Um, and Ken, there's a little, little bit of a theme going through this, the, these presentations so far of the different companies or the same companies that we, we've worked for. Um, but by working overseas, um, it led me into my HR background. Um, and I studied at Bedford University for a, a, a my um, CIPD um, qualification in, in HR management and spent 12 years at Thomas Cook um, running their overseas HR function, which had a remit of 3,000 employees um, working across 57 destinations. And because I'd worked overseas, I could relate to the challenges that it was, um, the skills that were needed to work overseas at all levels. I finished my time overseas as a manager overseas, and that, that meant when I was recruiting for managers, I knew the things that the qualities and skills that, that were needed. So by putting myself and gaining that experience working abroad stood me in good stead for my career um, into both HR, but also running the overseas operation for Thomas Cook. Um, and that was a full role of recruitment, placements, training, um, employee relations, a real kind of breadth of the, the HR spectrum, but in an environment that I was kind of used to um, in, in the destination. Um, worked through many incidents such as the, the ash cloud that I think Steve had mentioned earlier and a variety of hurricanes where our people are faced with incredibly challenging situations and then having to, to, to support those people through that and, and managed through two mergers as well. Um, we had an overseas team that, were, that merged Thomas Cook and, and My Travel, and then a second merger literally a couple of years later, an internal merger, but was, was a lot more challenging, was the UK um, merging with its continental overseas team. So you had two teams in, say, Tenerife, one that was in one team looking after the UK customer and then a completely separate team looking after the German, the French, the Dutch customers. And, and we merged those two together. And that was a real coming together of cultural differences in a work setting and navigating our way, way through that was, um, was, was, was at times quite, quite challenging. And I I remember a, a, a friend that I got very that I worked very closely with in HR in the, in the Belgian office said to me once, cultural awareness can be dis explained very easily as in, in heaven, the, uh, the English entertain, the French cook and the German organize, uh, but in hell, um, the English cook, the German entertain and the French organize. Um, and it was something that, for, OK, I get the differences in the culture. Um, and then. After Thomas Cook, I, I took a change in career and still in travel, but into the events kind of led industry. And I joined uh, Ibiza Rocks and I went from a corporate and the word corporate has meant, been mentioned a couple of times this morning by Steve and by Ben. Um, I left the corporate world of Thomas Cook and, and joined Ibiza Rocks. Um, and Ibiza Rocks is a privately owned family run company, but has a very, very strong brand name. I, when my time in Ibiza, I, I knew Ibiza Rocks well. Um, and it was a complete change for me to come out of a corporate world and go and stay in the same sector, although a slightly different sector, and go to, to, to Ibiza Rocks. So based, my role is based in the UK, but I spend quite a bit of my time um, on the road, on the road, in the air flying um, to Ibiza. I'm either working at home, working in our London office or, or, or in Ibiza, which is, which obviously is, is, is fantastic. 
So a little bit about Ibiza Rocks quickly. Um, Ibiza Rocks as a company has, has been kind of making noise, as we say, since 2005. And I'm sure many of you will be able to recognize a lot of the artists that are, are on that screen there that, that have um, graced the stage around our, um, our little venue in San Antonio and some, some of the world's most famous, famous artists. It's a, real, um, it's a real kudos for the brand that we're able to attract people like that. Um, and none more so than, than Stormzy's uh, Murky Festival. He played Glastonbury on the Friday, um, headlined Glastonbury, and then on the Tuesday he was in Ibiza at our venue. And, and so we have real pulling power. So it's, it's brilliant to work in a brand that has that pulling power, even though it's one hotel on one little island in the, in the Mediterranean. A quick, a very quick history talk, very, very quickly about the brand. It started its life as Manumission um, back in the 90s, and I've, I've chosen a more apt picture that anybody that have heard of show that wouldn't have been appropriate as to what Manumission show was about. Um, but that, that was the kind of starting point for the brand's evolution. Um, it then, then um, created a bar in San Antonio for live music and the Libertines played a few times at, at, the, at the bar in San Antonio and out of the birth of that, the evolution of the brand was then into hotels. And in 2008, we opened up a 363 room hotel um, where customers could stay at the hotel, be on their balcony and watch wonderful artists such as the Kaiser Chiefs. A real um, diversification of the product to now say, right, people can stay with us as well as just going into a bar and, and grabbing a beer and watching a band play. So um, a real evolution of the product over, over, those, over those years. Um, and today the evolution has continued where we've gone from a night event company to a daytime, realizing that the, the, the daytime is more what our type of audience want to, want to engage in. Um, and we now run, well, in a normal world, over a hundred pool parties a, a, a summer. Our audience, I, I won't go through that. It's, it's fairly simple who are, you probably all know who our audience are. But the good thing about our audience are they're very um, tough and robust. And so when we're thinking about our challenges and the things that I've got to think about in terms of room sales, then our audience are those that are probably happy to get on a plane and travel. We saw this summer some go away still, even with the pandemic. And uh, we have confidence going into next summer with our with our audience profile. Um, and we've also got, in, in my role, work with a lot of partners as well. So although I work in the travel industry, I have the opportunity a lot of time to reach out and work with brands that aren't in the travel industry. And you can see some that are on the screen there. A lot of those are very well-known brands, but in a real mixture from clothing companies to TV companies to radio stations to drinks brands, you get to really broaden your mind where you're not you're working in a certain industry, but you're working closely with people in other industries as well. So that's real benefit to me where you really pick up skills from liaising with some of some great and wonderful people that work at some of these these great brands that, that that we partner with. And of course, we need to talk about 2020. Um, one of the most challenging summers for every single person that works in the industry. It doesn't matter what you do in the travel industry. 2020 has literally been like no other summer. But one of the things that we really worked hard at doing when we got the hotel open was being certified as being safe. Um, that's what we felt our customers wanted to know, that we were a safe property. And we spent a lot of time um, making sure that we were safe. So it's something that the health and safety part was something that we really had to throw ourselves um, into. And we were um, we were certified as being um, under the Spanish scheme of, of, of safe tourism that, that allowed us to get open and start operating in the summer. But we, we had to evolve. Um, so very quickly, um, it was 2020 was testing our skills as, as crisis, crisis management of epic proportions. We cancelled May and June and had to navigate ourselves through dealing with all the customers. And, and I say they're disappointed. Many yes, customers were disappointed, but they equally understood, which obviously helped. Um, but we did get open. We opened on the 1st of July. We operated until the end of September, nearly the end of September. Um, and we reached nearly half full. Um, but the Foreign Office advice that changed in um, at the end of August, at the end of July, sorry, which meant no travel to Spain really kind of hurt us. Um, and we really had to think on our feet and be ready to face these ever changing um, goalposts and challenges that we were faced with this summer, managing our costs versus the, the revenue um, and 
at the end of the season, we literally, it's been a bruising summer um, and a bruising summer for the industry. Let's, you know, we have to recognise that. But for us, you know, we made just 10% of our revenue that we had made in 2019. So it just, just paints that picture of just how difficult a summer it was for us. But we got open. And as you can see on the right there, we, we were able to have a couple of highlight moments with um, Fat Boy Slim playing in the, in the hotel. Uh, which was which was brilliant and a real boost to to, to all the team. So um, my role um, at the company, I as, as I've said, I look after the sales of the hotel and um, operational development, and the focus is on three things: room sales, service delivery, and in, and the employee experience as well. So HR still sits within my within my remit. Um, so room sales, what does my role insist? What does my role um, undertake in terms of room sales? I have to make sure that the hotel is as full as possible. <clears throat> so I have to make sure that we have the, the, the right pricing strategy in place to make sure we're not selling too cheap, we're not selling too we're not selling too expensive, which is which means we won't sell. So we've got to get the pricing strategy right, <clears throat> excuse me, and when we discount, when we don't discount, et cetera. Um, and it's really important for us to try and get as much traffic as we can direct. Um, because if we get people booking directly with us, we get the, the deposits and we get the cash and being a seasonal business, we have to manage our, <clears throat> excuse me, we have to manage our way through the, through the winter season. But it's also about finding the balance between our average room rate and our occupancy. We want to sell the rooms as much as we can for the best rate we can, but we don't want to be too expensive that we're then getting which impacts our occupancy and our uh, the hotel not being as full will impact on our food and beverage revenue because the more people at the event, the more people spending money in the bar. <clears throat> so it's a balancing act, and it, it's something that we, in my role, I need to keep a real a real close eye on every every single day, making sure that we've got good levels of entry level stock, which can sometimes mean we have to overbook rooms um, to make sure that we overbook the entry level because we can always upgrade people but that we've always got our entry level um, room rate available. Um, making sure offers match the audience profile. Sometimes it's not all about the discount. People have got a budget in mind. They know they're happy to spend it. Whereas if we throw in a free room upgrade or a free bottle of Prosecco or a free VIP bed with a booking, that can entice people more than if it's just than 10% off. So it's sometimes finding the right incentives and offers to, to, to match the, our audience profile. Um, and the last two bits are around us managing the other 50% of our distribution. We want half coming direct, but we need our partners, Jet2 on the beach, booking.com to, to support us as well. So we manage them and the relationship with them. And also we look to secure group business in the, in the shoulders, as in, Ibiza is a June to September model, but we ideally we need to keep the hotel open in May and October. So we, we look at incentive groups um, to take some of the, the bed stock. Very quickly, customers are king, um, as I'm sure you all know, and I, I'm sure you do. You, you will um, be looking at customer service a lot through, and, and how we serve customers um, and the customer is king in our business. Um, it's important that we have a very clear customer ethos. Um, that we give the very best service and product to our customers. We train our staff on what our ethos is and who our customers are. We set targets for our staff in terms of meeting customer targets. We take care of our customers and, and, and things don't always go right. Um, and as, a, as I'm sure you can imagine, having 30,000 18 to 30 year olds across four months of the summer with alcohol and heat, there are times when things don't go right um, and we need to take care of our customers um, when those things kind of don't go right. Um, and then getting customer feedback. SurveyMonkey we use, it's a tool that we use to, um, to assess, we ask customers for their feedback and we assess that feedback and, and evolve our product accordingly. And we also look at social sites as well to see what customers are, are saying publicly about us as well. And, you know, we have to live in the real world sometimes, not all the feedback is positive, but we have to take the positive from it and do something about it. Um, so the customer is a priority that, to us, and that's something that in my role I, I take care of. And then thirdly, my key, key part of my role is, is focus on our people. Um, happy people are productive people. Um, so we have a fairly robust kind of HR funnel. We recruit um, through UK assessment centres. 
Um, and I think Ben spoke about the fact having to stand up in front and sell a trip to the moon and, and a really kind of tough assessment center. And, and, and we apply the same. If, if we make our recruitment robust at the beginning, then we find the right people that will stay with us throughout the whole summer. So we certainly do put people um, uh, through their paces and, and we really look for, for people to shine and we want them to be themselves and, and bring out their personality through through a, a really kind of engaging recruitment process right at, at the start. Um, and then we focus on making sure people are trained and inducted well, have a career progression. Yes, some people will work with us just for one summer, but also it's really important to us that we don't promote, we, we don't recruit managers. We would like to promote within. So we have a progression program that we run for people to join that leads them into a, a managerial position. Um, and because the people that can be managers, if they know the business really well, that, that that's good for us. We make sure we take care of our, our team through the summer. It's a tough summer, it's hot, it's challenging, it's difficult um, as much as it's fun, but we have to take care of our people through mid-season incentives and meals and, and rewards and recognition as well. And we, we aim to develop our managers um, through management development programs. Um, but just from a recruitment process, just the, we, we tend to recruit at a customer facing level um, and recruit very much receptions, event sales, events, um, VIP staff, event production, and, and we look at placements as well. So I'm very much, as you've probably already gathered, very much an advocate of the overseas world and, and just what that gives you as a person in your when you're starting out in travel. So we're really keen to, to recruit from the UK, bring people in that really want a career in travel, spend some a summer or a career with us. Um, and even if that is a even if that is a placement, then we know that we are supporting someone with their with their future in the travel industry. Uh, and then just finally, um, we have some opportunities for 2021 and, and you have to look at what 2020 has given us. And it is what it is. And it's been excruciatingly difficult, but there will be opportunities out of the back of it. So a couple that we're looking at where we always need to think forward and take the best out of the worst. Um, we're looking to see what we can, can we broaden our offering in Ibiza? Um, can we have Ibiza rocks maybe more in more hotels in Ibiza? Can we take Ibiza rocks on the road into new destinations? Could you have an Ibiza rocks experience in say Malta where we're putting on events? Or could we work with hotels um, because it, the youth market is a market that is going to be at the front of the cue when it comes to travel really opening up again because they're going to be the most confident to go um, so other hotels might want to get into the youth market and we could support them support them with that but there are some challenges for us to, for us that we've got to really consider and navigate our, our way through um, and some of them up there I won't talk about uh, kind of all of them um, but customer confidence is something we're nervous about we hope that January peaks, given positive news about vaccine last week, will um, will hopefully mean that January is a time when people are booking. Certainly, our audience work profile, but we just don't know, um, and we are trying to understand what customer confidence is is like, and trying to manage our business for the for the for the best, even though that it might be still challenging. Um, safety regulations and government restrictions. We've all lived through the ever changing restrictions from March to now, they've been this one minute, that the next. Um, and we are trying to set up a program knowing or not knowing what the restrictions might be. Um, and Ibiza venues, Ibiza is a, has a USP of being, um, a lot of people come and have a list of things that they want to do. And if some of the um, USP like the Ibiza clubs don't open, then that means people might start looking elsewhere to go on holiday and think about Ibiza in future years when it's back to normal. Um, and so that's, that's that's an issue for us because it, it could impact our, our sales as well. So a number of challenges for us to, to navigate through and, and we always have to take that time out to understand what those challenges are so that we can try to navigate our way through them. If we know what they are, we can start planning for them. And it literally comes down to that famous line of you plan for the worst and, and you hope for the best. And it's something that is standing us hopefully in, in, in good stead as we aim for 2021. Um, and just in closing, I'm not, I'm not a big one for inspirational quotes, but something that I have 
liked through the many years that a previous CEO, Thomas Cook, once um, spoke to me about was a famous quote by a lady called Maya Angelou, who said that she's learned that people will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And that's always resonated with me through a number of years of my career, because I think from an employee perspective, how you treat your team um, and how they feel working for you, if you make them feel good about their role, they will pull up trees for you. And secondly, if you make people feel like they're having a wonderful experience as a customer, they will return to you and they will shout about your business. And so that particular quote has always really resonated with me about how we make our team feel and how we make our customers feel when they're experiencing the product that we're that we're delivering. And then finally, um, just some some thoughts from me in terms of your future. Um, and I think be yourself. I think that is in, incredibly important. Don't be who you think others want you to be because you'll be found out. Be yourself. Trust yourself. Trust yourself in terms of the qualities and skills that you've got. So trust yourself and think big. Um, find your passion. I think Ben spoke about that. You are on a pathway to a wonderful career in travel, but travel has many areas, whether that is with airlines, with retail, with um, working in hotels. So find, you found, I believe, your passion in travel, but there are maybe a, another part of travel that is still yet to be, to be found. So be yourself, trust yourself, think big, find your passion, but don't forget to work hard and play hard. That's super, super important. So from me, thank you. Um, the very, very best of luck with your course um, and your exciting future in travel. It's, um, it's been a real pleasure, privilege to have the opportunity to talk to you today and um, really proud to have the opportunity to talk to the future of the travel industry. So thank you very much. Chris, thank you. That was a really, really fascinating and informative presentation. So thank you very much. Are you going to be able to join us for Q&A? Yes, 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 definitely. Yes, that, that would be great. But I do have one quick question, which is very um, sort of uh, specific to Ibiza Rocks. Uh, it's a great question, actually, um, which is how will Ibiza Rocks, the company, navigate the pushback from the Spanish resorts and authorities to reduce opportunities to youth market products and culture overseas, which obviously is something that, you know, talking about responsible tourism and all that sort of stuff. Um, there has been a bit of a pushback, hasn't there, from the Spanish um, authorities? Um, there has, and um, it's there's, there's been a pushback on excess excess tourism, as as they like to call it. Um, excess meaning, you know, you apply people with drink and shove them out onto the onto the streets. And what we you know, we're working very closely with the local. If I just take San Antonio as an example, we're working really closely with the mayor. We're really working closely with other local politicians um, as to how we can play a part um, in managing both the youth audience that come to Ibiza, but also how other, other partners and suppliers work with the youth audience, because drinks promotions, and so for example, we've taken um, an opportunity to re re remove drinks promotions from our offering, and yes, of course, people will come and want to enjoy themselves and, and, and have a party, um, but the, it's the excessive part, it's tipping over into that e excessive part, so it's we are trying to forge relationships with other venues that, that we can work closely with in terms of partnering and putting content in, in their events as well. So it isn't just piling people out onto the street. They've always got somewhere else to go in terms of a secondary or third, third venue. We're looking at a festival model um, that brings other, other partners in. It, so it's, it's difficult, but it's working really hard with, with local politicians in a real collaborative way and looking at our own business as to how we can evolve our product um, and not have silly drinks promotions that are on all the time that a lot of venues have become so so it's been a big part of their business and that's something that we're we're looking to really change so that we we don't we're not part of the problem of excess tourism we're part of the solution yeah and and i would guess that the role of the rep will change um, to, to actually, I guess, help manage that. 
Yeah, very much, very much so. I mean, we have a we have a team of hosts. I mean, we're we're probably one of the only hotels that would that actually employs a ho a host team. So we have a team of six or seven, um, and part of their role is to really spend time with the customers to support them in their experience there and pointing out all of the good places because there are there are some not so good places to go in 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 a in a youth resort but there are some great places to go so our host team the a big part of their role is to really stoke, not just standing at reception behind a desk you know and speaking to people when when they want to, when they come up to them it's about going and finding customers spending time with them and helping them through the three or four days that they're there because it's some you know, we we do experience incidents that in, in the hotel and, and people going crazy on on the first night and um you know like a bit like a, a shop you know it's it's about working with customers to make sure that they've got four or five days you know take take it easy enjoy the whole trip and not just the first 24 hours where you're you're kind of binging and and our host team they're they're the first to spend time with the customers to help them through the, the three or four days or four or five days that, that they spend with us, that, they're, that they are pointing out some of the challenges and the things to avoid in the resort, the, the things to see and do um, that are the good things on, on, in the resort, but for also for them to, to take care of themselves. And we also work with um, external companies as well in terms of managing incidents in, in resort as well. And, and they work closely with us to kind of guide us to how we speak to customers that we're not preaching, um, where customers would just be going one ear and out the other. And a lot of that is about relationship building, being on a customer's level. And then once they once we've got that trust, they'll listen to us and we can direct people to the to the right places and, and not the wrong places so that they have a a safe and good holiday experience. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Chris. And and you're quite right. I mean, relationship building is is a crucial part to anyone's career anyway, um, more so in, in the travel and tourism sector and, and is also a fundamental part of networking, which obviously we've mentioned several times already. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to have to leave it there because we are running yeah. a, a running over. But um, uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure we'll have more questions in the Q&A panel a bit later.